As Director of the UCL Energy Institute, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural George Henderson Lecture and to UCL. Uh, it's particularly a pleasure to welcome such a prestigious audience and in particular to welcome our supporters uh, this evening. Uh, and just to mention just a few names, Richard Lorch, the editor of the Building Research and Information. Uh, there are many people here from SIBSI who have also supported us in this event. Uh, John Henderson and Paul Davidson from BRE uh, and um, who've all uh, helped us organise this evening and help record and publicise the event. Uh, and last but not least, Adrian Lehman from the Usable Building Trust who's worked uh, very much with Bill Bordas in um, uh, trying to help develop this uh, presentation and also Elizabeth Bordas as well. Uh, so, um, the event has been heavily oversubscribed, um, mostly via LinkedIn and Twitter, blowing the myth that this event would only be attended by grumpy old energy men. Um, <laughs> we've had many requests from overseas to record the event, um, so just to let everybody know that the event is being filmed. Um, so if there are any problems with that, just to let you know. Uh, there are no test fire alarms planned this evening, so if you do hear an alarm, could you please leave the auditorium uh, from the fire exits? Um, uh, we must leave the lecture theatre by 7 o'clock this evening, so I'm afraid we're going to keep us on, on to time. Uh, Bob Lowe, the Deputy Director of the UCL Energy Institute, is now going to uh, introduce the background to this lecture. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Many of you here I know knew George, uh, uh, but many of you I'm quite sure didn't. So I thought it would be uh, appropriate to say a few words uh, about George before we started. Um, George Henderson worked at the building research uh, establishment at Garston from 1975 to 1997. And I mean, I have to say, even though I, I knew him uh, uh, for the years afterwards, I always thought of him as a BRE man. He was involved in pioneering work on measuring the energy performance of buildings. He went on to develop the standard assessment procedure. One of my students asked me whether I developed the standard assessment procedure. I'm sorry I didn't. George did. Uh, George was the real thing. Um, uh, which has become an essential research tool and, and a tool of communication within uh, the community of people who are interested in the performance of, of housing in the United Kingdom. Uh, in recognition uh, of this work, he received, uh, along with two colleagues, uh, the ESSO Energy Award, which was awarded by the Royal Society in 1995. Uh, many of our students uh, submit papers to the ECEEE. Um, George was a founder member, along with Andrew Warren, uh, uh, of the uh, committee of the ECEEE. Um, uh, when was that, Andrew? 20 years ago, okay. And uh, served on the board and subsequently the advisory committee. Those who knew him, and I had the pleasure of knowing him just for a short while, uh, will remember him as a quiet and sensitive man, a modest uh, uh, man, and a great colleague. Uh, I can think of, I'm delighted to be able to welcome so many people to the first, the inaugural George Henderson Memorial Lecture. Uh, and I can think, I find it very hard to think of a better inaugural speaker than Bill Bordas. Uh, so it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce Bill. Um, I'm not going to uh, repeat Bill's biog. Um, either of you probably know far more about Bill than is in his biog, or you've hopefully uh, had a chance to, uh, to read it. Um, instead, I want to just give a, a very brief, brief sort of personal reflection based on my 20-odd years, in fact, it's 27 years, I think, um, that I've known, uh, known Bill. Uh, during this time, he's always been prepared to act as an unofficial mentor to, to, to lots of people, planting the seeds of innovative ideas, um, pointing out things always from a perspective of both a good theoretical understanding alongside, I think, a very practical perspective. And I think it's something essential in this area is, is bringing together both the, the theory and, and the practice. And uh, Bill has been running a, a masterclass for our PhD students um, 
uh, this afternoon, and so he's carrying on in that. Although the focus of tonight's presentation, I suspect, will be quite heavily on energy, uh, Bill is also renowned for his work more generally in building environments, understanding, for example, moisture-related problems. And I, I still look back uh, very fondly to a year that I spent working with uh, Bill on the roof of the House of Lords. Um, I learned a lot during that project. The aim was to try and find out if the Lords were getting wet heads from rain penetration or condensation from all the hot air that they produced. And I'll leave Bill to tell everybody the conclusion of that study later on in the bar tonight, if anybody's interested. Uh, it's therefore very fitting, I think, that Bill re recently received the OBE for services to architecture, engineering, and sustainable development. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Bill to give his presentation on improving building performance, sparing no expense to get something on the cheap. Um, at the end of Bill's presentation, we will have an international response. <laughs> Sorry. Do come up, come up. Uh, response to the lecture by Steve Selkovitz. And then we'll move on to 20-minute questions. So if you could leave the Q&A until after then, that would be really good. Thanks. Thank you, Taj. Good evening, everybody. Is the mic okay on my lapel like that? Can everybody hear all right? Good? Right. Well, the subject. We'll come to that a bit later, I think. Um, and the hashtag, if you want to twit. <laughs> and a summary. So, in terms of building performance, can we, yeah, it all works. You can see it up there. That's good. Well, you've read it faster than I've said it. But for those of you who want to go now, I thought I'd do single line conclusions. So I'm really worried about where we are. I think we're leaving too much to the markets and we're not developing enough in terms of the social and technical infrastructure. Now, um, we heard about grumpy old men from Taj, so I'm one of these grumpy old men. And, you know, so what did you do in the war, Daddy? You know, what are you doing sitting around for 40 years while all this was happening? Why isn't it better now? And, you know, there are lots of false dawns in my life history of things where you thought you'd made a breakthrough and then, for some reason, the waters closed over it. And what we've got is a very complicated system in terms of people and processes and technology and money and energy and building performance and the rest of it. And you know, how do we shake this system up in order to get it to something which is now responding to the massive challenges we have, not just in climate change, but energy security, biodiversity, you name it. You know, buildings are an enormous part of the problem and somehow they've got to become part of the solution. Otherwise, we're all stuck. So those who want to go now, that's the summary. So, setting the map, actually I'll just get my watch out to make sure I keep to time and there's enough things back. Here we go. Building performance is very much in the public interest. You know, we all live in them, we all work in them, they sit there and, you know, they can make us happy, they can help to make us healthy, or they can do the exact opposite. And they're around for an awful long time. You know, what happens is we make design lives and modern buildings 50 years. I don't know what they are. But the fact is what you usually find with buildings is if you've got one, you either wish you hadn't or you want it to last forever. And everybody's interested in them, you know, as building users. But where's our voice? And now we want to improve the performance of the stock, but we haven't had a good feedback loop from building performance to construction, design, and policy making. So now we're a bit stuffed because what we want to do is make an enormous difference, but we haven't got a terribly good knowledge base for doing it. You know, do we really understand what we're doing? Because essentially the fact that buildings seldom work as well as we would have hoped is something that's been known for quite a long time and it was you know, certainly beginning to be 
I mean, it goes back you know, many, many decades. But if you look in the 90s, there was quite a lot of work that was done, including some that I was involved in, that was saying, look here, we've got a problem. The buildings that we're designing to be more sustainable and lower energy aren't quite there. So here's the cover of a report, Flying Blind, which was actually published by the Association of Conservation Energy, which I wrote, Andrew Warren's in the second row here, 12 years ago, showing people in denial of building performance. This was, in fact, some information from a Green Building of the Year award, which I analysed. It was the year award 96, I think it was, and we analysed it in 98, 99. And what we were finding again and again is that this performance gap, we called it the credibility gap, which probably wasn't terribly good PR. The performance gap seems to be a little bit more gentle. There it was. What we find the extraordinary thing is that the, everybody around the table was wearing blindfolds. The designer, the builder, not only that, but the facilities manager and the owner. There's this sort of elephant in the room. In fact, I was thinking the other day, you know, it's not the elephant in the room, the elephant is the room. We know we're so much inside the elephant, we can't really see what's happening. Now, I got this cartoon terribly wrong when I briefed Hellman to draw it because what I should have added to it was a policymaker wearing not only blindfolds but also earmuffs observing this <laughs> through his blind eye through a telescope because it has been really scandalous what's been happening over the last decade or more in relation to policy not tuning into the messages that really come back from building performance. Now fortunately, a few years ago I had to sort of talk about the performance gap because people say, well, no, it doesn't really exist. In fact, I was at a meeting yesterday when some people still said it didn't exist. You know, well, you really were inside the elephant for that. But in fact, just last week, a thing called Carbon Buzz, which UCL's been involved in quite a bit, was launched. And these are some graphs which were shown last week, which show in green the actual energy performance of buildings in that database, and in red, the theoretical energy performance for those buildings. Now, this isn't the best graph, because what it ought to do is, for each record, show the theoretical and the actual, where actually we've got distribution curves for actual and theoretical. But what you can see in schools, the median is about twice what the design has expected. In offices, it's about 50% more. And in universities, don't ask. You know, it's really gone through the roof. Because the universities often default to on. There is kit on all day, 24-7, 365, that's often unnecessarily so, particularly in laboratory buildings often, you know. So what you get is myths that things are 24-hour buildings, but the only thing that 24 hour about them often is that there's stuff going on there 24 hours a day. So we've got, we're sitting on this complete mountain of avoidable waste. And what can we do about it? Because we just don't seem to be able to get the right sort of action. And here we are, you know, in housing, we've been mostly on non-domestic and where I've been working, but here's EcoBuild, 6th of March, and here's the minister, the minister shaking hands with the CEO of the Zero Carbon Hub, wanting, setting up a study of the performance gap in housing. And yet this is, we're now 40 years after the oil crisis and the three-day week and the rest of it, the sort of thing that really catapulted energy use in buildings way up the agenda and led to some quite interesting work in the late 70s and early 80s. What are we doing? Because we're trying to make things more sustainable. There are lots of things to do. You'd have thought after four decades we'd have at least gotten charge of energy and carbon, and we haven't. And it's not just that. Here's an occupant survey using the BUS method developed by Adrian Lehman, who Taj or Bob mentioned. And what we've got is a number of environmental parameters. I needn't read them out, sort of headline. But essentially, if you look at the mean occupant response in these buildings against the mean of the records in the reference data set, if the value is statistically significantly worse than the average at the 95% level, then the flag comes up red, and essentially things are bad on the left and good on the right. If you can't tell the difference between the average, it's amber, and if it's fantastic, it's green. Now, this was a school, you know, one of the building schools for the future schools, that won an award. 
It won several awards. And what was green? Image to visitors. So essentially, it looks good, but does it really work? Sorry, no. And we found this again and again. And the building school's future was a complete disaster in many ways. You know, but things were done on what, essentially, based on what looked as if it worked well, rather than what did. And we're now very much reaping the whirlwind of all that in buildings which are too expensive to look after. And so you get these sort of comments. This is a comment from a student in his school. You know. The architect showed next to no sense. It leaked in the rain, was intolerably hot in sunlight. Pretty perhaps sustainable, maybe, but practical it is not. Again and again we found that the people who've been actually setting the agenda for new buildings don't know how the things work. Now, this is a study that I was involved in a little bit last year in relation to the Green Deal, or what I call the Green Subprime Deal, I'm afraid, but I hope it won't turn into that. And what is the knowledge base for retrofit? And Neil May led this study. I don't know if Neil May is here this evening. Anyway, credit to Neil May and some of the teams are, are on here. And you can download this if you Google STBA on the web. But essentially, but the people who ought to know, don't know. And the people who sometimes do know, like the heritage professions, don't get terribly close to the construction profession. And so, and then there are considerable a lack of connection between research and practice and guidance. A lot of people get their guidance from trade literature and things like that, which may not take correct account of context. A lot of the software isn't actually worked terribly well in the context. And also, often people want to do things from a shopping list, but what you need is a systemic approach. Often you find something works in one context, doesn't necessarily work in the other. So there are massively good opportunities for improving our building stock. But we have to be really careful to do that with the right depth of understanding. And some of that depth of understanding can be crystallized very easily, perhaps, by just going through a filter saying, you know, is this thing risky or isn't it? No, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. This is something we can run ahead. You know, you're, you're unlikely to have caused dry rot by insulating a hot water cylinder or something like that. But you might cause dry rot by internally insulating a wall if you don't do it in the right sort of way. So again, we've got this creaky knowledge base for this massive job that we need to do. And yet, why haven't we taken account of the evidence under our noses? I mean, it's completely mad if we want to innovate. Everybody, you know, Nobel Prize winners designing experiments and things, you know, they get it wrong. You know, even matches on a production line, you need a feedback system to tell you what's happening. But the construction industry has not been good on its feedback system. And as Frank Duffy said, past president of the RIBA, you know, we're not like the medics, but then buildings are perhaps a bit more diverse than people. You know, people these days are the same basic body shape and things like that. But the point is, people are always saying, I'm saying all the time, people in the construction industry are saying we haven't got the information. And what they mean is we don't know the information's there, it's not in our silo. Because what happens is, for the most part, The construction industry builds things. They hand over the keys and run away. Now, that wasn't necessarily so important decades ago because government had quite a lot of in-house professionals that helped to close the feedback loop because they were developing public buildings. They were also getting feedback from it, sometimes rather nasty feedback. And nevertheless, it did work. But quite a lot of that's been distant. And then you've got people wanting to bury bad news. So what happens, you know, we've got a dysfunctional system which isn't working properly. It's not delivering really good buildings, certainly not consistently. But essentially, you know, if you stand out and be counted, then the messenger gets shot. So you know, it's really, really horrible how often the negative learning experiences, which are the things that you can really learn from, you make buildings better most rapidly by getting rid of the bad things rather than doing more good things, often go down the memory hole. So you find again and again, since those aren't shared and learned from, a decade or so after somebody's been making some mistakes, maybe, or haven't, you know, things haven't worked different, you suddenly find that it wakes up again. I was talking to somebody at the master class, you know, 
25 years ago we did work on heat pumps and find some problems and then all of a sudden they come home along as a great white hope by the policy makers and then suddenly you know you get performance trials and things come back saying well actually a lot of heat pumps don't work very well because it's not the heat pump that's necessarily the problem it's the application to engineering. And then case study evidence I mean, what I find is you get this sort of thing, the case study is the canary in the coal mine. You find a building works really well, what were the magic ingredients? You find a building works really badly, what elephant traps did it fall in? But people are always saying, we need a statistically significant sample, we need more evidence. No, just trust the evidence under your noses, use it to say, what have I found here, what does it mean, how can I use that to improve what I do? Because, you know, a few years ago, I was talking about a step change in building performance, but if we want a step change in building performance, we've got to have a sea change about the way we do things. So how can we actually alter the system to improve the outcomes? Well, let's have a look a bit at the sort of vicious processes that have been occurring over decades that have caused this connection if not to unravel, certainly to get a bit weak. You know, we've got these long-lasting buildings, and if you go back to sort of distant times, sort of pre-industrial revolution anyway, a lot of the stuff happened locally. So we had evolutionary with people generally who were from nearby who built the things. And, you know, well, we went to Roman times, you know, an engineer who built an arch had to stand underneath it when the, when the formwork was removed. So if the arch wasn't structurally sound, then the engineer wasn't structurally sound either. Um, but then what we had is when the Industrial Revolution came along, then a whole lot of things could happen that distant supply and demand. And what happened was building professionals tended to appear at that level, you know, starting with the architect, to protect, you know, industry against sometimes rapacious clients or clients who were trying to do the right thing against incompetent industry, trying to be the honest broker in the middle and protect public interest. And then as buildings became more science-based, what one found in a lot of countries, in Britain it was in 1926, countries decided in the national interest it was important because of the diffuse nature of buildings, their long life, um, and the diffuse nature of the construction industry, that one needed some solid information to base that on. So BRE, set up as BRS, was there in natural interest, started off in a natural science lab, but broadened out lots more uh, aspects of building performance. And then, as I mentioned, the public sector filled up with professionals particularly after the Second World War in rebuilding the country in social democracy. And so what you had was a lot of stuff. I mean, when I first entered the buildings area in the early 70s, you could go to the technical department of the Greater London Council and get some fantastic stuff. You opened an edition of the Architects' Journal, there was a building research station digest drum in the back of it. It had a technical study with details and things in it showing how you did it. We had an IHBE journal which was full of nuts and bolts about how you made heating systems work, etc. There tends to be an enormous split between that. Often the journals have gone advertorial um, for the professions and the journals for the academics have gone a bit esoteric. But building performance sort of picked up as an academic subject particularly at Strathclyde and Berkeley in the late 1960s. Some of that came out sort of operational research thinking in the war, so I understand. And so just over 40 years ago, this book was published, Building Performance by the Building Performance Research Unit, which looked into largely schools. And it was a really good book, get it, read it, because quite a lot of the things they saw in these schools, you find in building schools for the future. You know, Stuff that's designed for daylight but doesn't quite get it, but gets overheating, etc., etc. But, extraordinarily, you know, this should have been four years after the unit was set up. This should have been the foundation stone for the unit. But instead it was the tombstone. The academics had separated from practice. 
They were more interested in developing theories and interesting practice, influencing practice. And as Eric Drexler said, the problem with lots of things which were interdisciplinary is it's very difficult to pin them down and they escape from any discipline whatsoever. And so did feedback in 1962. The RIBA had a plan of work which had stage end feedback in it. Stage end survived, but in the architect's appointment, document which is saying what you do to set up your legal process with an architect. They threw it out in 1972. Why? One, because you couldn't really quantify what you did, and two, because clients wouldn't pay for it, including government clients. So what we got is this sort of unforced amnesia. But then the amnesia got worse. You know, following the late 60s, where one found that a lot of the sort of comprehensive redevelopment and Ronan Point and you name it, you know, traffic architecture and the rest of it was not as socially benign as people had hoped. We got a swing, you know, the oil crises and three-day weeks and um, IMFs and all the problems of that kind, um, rather smaller than we have now, but that's another issue. But we got the growth in the idea of free markets, we got the growth in the idea of professionals who were a conspiracy against the public, just like industry was in um, Smith's day. And then we had the Rothschild Report, which was advocating a con customer contractor relationship to government applied research. So, you know, government should be more of an intelligent customer. But essentially, at the Rothschild time, the assumption was that government would be full of enough career scientists, etc who could act as intelligent customers for things happening in the market. But the outsourcing has actually gone too far. After the oil crisis, there was a lot of good solid work done on energy performance. A lot of people were trying to do things. I'll give an example later of something that I was involved in. But, and then we had an energy demonstration program in the late 70s through to 1988. But the problem, again, that was focusing on trying to get shining examples and burying bad news. So the result is not much came out of the end of the energy efficiency demonstration program. Because, you know, if it was bad news, it wasn't a shining example. If it was a shining example, it probably wasn't terribly relevant for what you needed. And then Mark Twain said, a few things harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. You know, essentially, if you're not careful, this thing comes between too clever, clever. So then the government sort of started progressing the pulling of plugs out of the switchboard, outsourcing its brain, outsourcing its feedback loops. And so, as Al Gore said, your social contract's been fractured by outsourcing. You know, system malfunction is often because there's no feedback. You know, what you need is negative feedback to stop it going off in the wrong direction. So a lot of stuff here, which government at least has received tacit knowledge about how things were working, both on the energy supply side and on the demand side, started slipping through its fingers. And perhaps one of the most important things in the recent couple of decades was the dismemberment of the Department of the Environment. In fact, if there was a golden age for building performance evaluation in government, it was probably between 1992 and 1995. 1992 was just after the Rio conference and also the Department of Energy had been abolished and the energy efficiency bit for buildings came into the EOE. So even though it was all very fragmented and you know, it wasn't really joined up government, it was in one place. The EOE was intelligent customer for the building research establishment. Um, Margaret Thatcher in the late 80s had made encouraging noises about sustainability. Then there was the Rio conference in 1992 which led to a whole lot of interesting research projects in relation to building performance and reducing their carbon dioxide emissions. And then in 1995, that started to go down the snake with the preparation for the privatization of BRE, etc. So the result is, governments rather lost its institutional memory. So it hasn't been able anymore to grow the experts who might be working with outsourced contractors, etc., but they had a career path within government to develop their knowledge area in relation to building performance. And then what happened, post-1997, is that essentially building performance started getting confused with construction. 
And one of the reasons for that is, you know, BRE had been outsourced, Department of the Environment that was started drifting apart, and the research program, the construction sponsorship, which had been in the Department of the Environment, got shifted to the Department of Trade and Industry. So the result is there was confusion that building performance was all about construction. And so what we had in rethinking construction, it was great. I mean, it was supposed to be a bit customer focused and look at performance indicators, but actually most performance indicators were about how you built it, how speedily, how efficiently, how less rework, that sort of thing. They weren't about what happened at the end of the line. And ditto, you know, even the title's wrong here, even as though this was CETR and Department of Trade and Industry, it wasn't rethinking building innovation and research, it was rethinking construction innovation and research. And one of the problems with this, and I'm sorry, I don't know if I said it in the next slide or not, no, I didn't, so I'll keep it on this slide, is that essentially in this report, it was realised that building performance was slightly different from construction, but it was thought that most of that could be dealt with by regulation. So essentially all you had to do is tell people what to do, not learn from what happened and make that go better. So we now have a situation where essentially the sort of feeling within government, certainly around 2000, and a lot of it's still there, I think there are, you know, there are a few signs of hope, but not for me terribly many, but then I'm probably just a grumpy old man, that, you know, the construction industry owns building performance. But maybe it's the property industry owns building performance. Or maybe it's the facilities management industry that owns building performance. But from my point of view, none of them do. You know, they all have a part in the system, but the system is much, 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 much bigger than that. And what happens is, you get people saying, we're not improving building performance because it's a market failure. And, you know, I don't think this is something you can use markets for, or you certainly can't use it unless you've created a market for building performance. And that could get you into very dangerous categories, like, you know, every building a PFI, well, that would bankrupt the country. You know, you've got to find a way to do this with a much lighter touch than that. Now, unfortunately, there are lots and lots of category errors. Um, category errors looking for an answer in the wrong place, you know, sort of all bananas or atheists or something like that, you know, something you're completely in the wrong place. Now, essentially, we've, we've had the construction industry one, but also the energy industry, you know, sort of turning to the energy industry for various things, assuming it understands the demand side, it doesn't. You know, it can't understand the demand side because it's actually been set up through European competition policy, etc., so that you can change supplier and rest, but you don't get the close relationship between the supply side of the energy industry and the demand side of the energy industry, like you get, say, in California with Pacific Gas and Electric. I mean, they had a, they had a bit of a, a flirtation with free markets in the late 90s, and look where that got them with Enron, so they went back to local monopolies. So, you know, markets and regulations, no, no, no. You know, you've got to have more vision, you've got to have more judgment. And then we've got this problem as you know, improving the performance of the building stock is all about throwing money at it, you know, doing deep refurbishments and things like that. Well, it's great if you can afford to do it, but there's an awful lot you can do just by understanding the issues and tackling them in a much more sophisticated and much less expensive way. We don't need sledgehammers to crack nuts. And then there's the thing of innovations about technical innovation. And, yeah, that's nice, but, you know, the, sort of, the mindset is you sort of grab something from the blue sky and shove it down the throats of the building industry, where, in fact, what one finds is that often innovation is about purposeful improvement, doing things differently because you've seen a gap, things that aren't working very well, things that could be made to work better, things that could fill in holes which seem to be there, it's about bringing people, processes, and things together in better ways. Often very much the same people, processes, and things, but massively better results. And then we've got this, unfortunately this came along, this came along, I think, in the late 70s. We talked about energy conservation, and then that was all a little bit too difficult, you know, a bit too hash-shirted. So we talked about energy efficiency. But as Jevon said, you know, and he was an economist at UCL about 150 years ago, wasn't he? He was looking at you know, steam engines, etc. He said, 
You don't necessarily save energy by making things more efficient. You can find more ways of using energy instead. So what we've got is we've got the wrong objective function. You know, we do not, we can't transform this system by stealth. We've got to say, we need to get energy requirements down, not pretend that efficiency will do it and then be surprised when it didn't. And then, you know, there's a lot of thought now, you know, particularly with the Google set with this, well, well, you know, all you need to do is put all this data into a great big melting pot and we'll know what to do. What you find again and again in buildings, you haven't captured the context for that data, the data isn't necessarily as useful as you might think. And what I often find in data on buildings is the more you get, if you're not careful, the more rubbish you get in the system, and actually the less useful things you can tell about it. The medians are good, you know, certain things like that are good, but it doesn't it tell you. So you've got this really confused situation where building performance is confused with construction and markets. And policy measures don't join up. We've got far too many of them that trip us up rather than a few that are actually smart and get us pulling together to do things because often they make things far too complicated. And then we've got the wrong sort of procurement system. You, know, you don't have a sort of single person generally or a single team taking a building from design intent to operation anymore, you know. Somebody does an economic analysis, somebody gets planning permission, somebody develops an outline design, somebody develops the details, somebody builds it. Now, how can we possibly get the right sort of attention to detail when the people who are executing aspects of it didn't have much idea of the initial design intent, it was just handed down to them as a set of drawings? So governments fail to provide the core technical infrastructure that would help society to self-organise around producing better buildings' performance. And some of the useful things it might have, like display energy certificates, are actually being sidelined at the moment by the ministry. So you know, you'd expect that if you wanted to save energy and carbon in buildings, you then have that would be the objective function. Not a bit of it. We've got all these policy measures that swirl around a hole in the middle. And then we've got the carbon fog. You know, people buy electricity, they buy gas, they may or may not know what they use, but when it's turned into carbon, what is it? So, you know, here's Bunsfield. But anyway, you know, we need to get real about all this. And unfortunately, we've been very much better over the last 10 years of saving energy and carbon in the virtual world than in the real one. So it seems to us we're relying too much on markets for solutions. And this was interesting. Um, John Ashton was giving a talk at the Royal Society of Arts about a month ago. And he well, used to be a climate change spokesman um, in the Foreign Office and did a lot in terms of international negotiations. And Britain has been punching way above its weight internationally about that. When I was working in California five years ago, they adopted a zero energy policy by 2030. And I was actually at a conference where the policymaker, Diane Grunig, who'd pushed that through the California Public U Utilities Commission. And I said, how on earth did you do that? And she said, we went to London. We saw what you were doing on zero carbon. But our zero carbon, you know, is a political fudge. And their zero energy, they might just get there because they're basing that on more solid fundamentals. Steve Selkovitz will tell you a bit about the moment. Well, this brings me to our, my, you know, quote, that we seem to be sparing no expense to get something on the cheap. You know, what we're doing is we're trying to look at markets, trying to get things cheaply. What we're doing is we're doing a lot of things badly rather than a few things well, and this particularly affects building performance. So how do we actually maintain the chain of progress on all this? How can we improve the knowledge and capacity? Well, now where was the old git while all this was happening? Well, I tried, this was one of the jobs I did, I sort of came out of the science lab and into a design office, RMJM, which is unfortunately a shadow of its former self, but this is one of the buildings we did which came out of the oil crisis. It was the National Farmers head Union head, um, Insurance Headquarters, Stratford-on-Avon, it was completed in 1983, it was designed in 1979, but the riot tollers and things that got in the way of its delivery. And it was a mixed mode building. So what you had is you had a relatively compact head office, which would normally perhaps have been air conditioned, and it wasn't. And I'm very pleased to say it was refurbished five years ago, and they didn't add air conditioning. In fact, they took air conditioning out of the bit in the executive suite where the management had insisted on having it. So a tolerably robust building in some ways. Then I got involved circa 1990 in reviewing demonstration projects and office case studies. 
And funny as there should be now there should be an image that came up there, but for some reason it's disappeared. I don't know quite what's happened there. Anyway, there should have been an image of an air conditioned office that was one of the best in our data set and had an energy performance similar to that of a naturally ventilated office. We also, sorry, no, this was actually a naturally ventilated office which performed well policy studied institute, which um, Adrian Lehman had looked at and I'd looked at, and we tried to find out why buildings work well for energy efficiency and occupant satisfaction. Was there a link? So we tried to combine some studies. I hope we don't lose graphics another time. And what we found was essentially this very simple diagram. But if the strategic design of the building was cognizant of how the building would be used and also helped to the client or the occupier to set up the right management system, then if things had been done tolerably well, you got positive relationships between human performance and energy efficiency. And what happened is this was based very much on where there's better understanding of user requirements. And you could usually name the individuals responsible. And this is something we seem to be missing a bit. Rather than bringing out the leaders, we're trying to codify everything. So you have a telephone directory of requirements rather than saying, how do we get the people who can motor this forward in a good place? Because what you find, a lot of other places, is there wasn't a connection in the design for manageability. And so, human performance and energy efficiency drifted apart. So the problem is you get these associations, you know, people like to claim that energy efficient buildings are comfortable, not necessarily, but if you have the right human factors in there, you can have your cake and eat it. So you really need to bring out the leaders. So, we were really keen to design for usability and manageability. It's a little diagram. We tried to bring together the physical and behavioral stuff. So this here's physical, here's behavioral. This is context-free, things you can take for granted everywhere. This is context-dependent, things which depend on where you are. Now, if it's context-free and physical, like the structural strength and this floor, you know, we tend not to want to think about flaws and the fact we're going to fall through them and that sort of thing. You, know, you can knock it, knock it down and fit and forget. But often you find... So, you know, that's invisible. You just get on with the lighting bill. You don't have to bother about the floor unless you want to have a tank museum in here or something like that, in which case there might be an issue. But then there are things that have to be implemented and managed. And so often one finds that people think that the stuff you can fit and forget isn't. It has to be usable and manageable. But then when you get down to the behavioural side, you've got to implement and internalize certain habits. And if you're going against the grain of the habits of the people that are there, then you may end up in a bad place. So, you know, you have to make these... But now, the best thing make habitual is that you either go with the grain of existing things that people understand, or alternatively, the design intent is so clear that it's intuitively obvious to the occupiers how they might use the building. And then over here is the risk, freedom, and robustness. You know, you can't get everything right. The context changes. You know, all of a sudden the building gets too, too, too expensive to occupy and you have to move out of it. It would be nice if it was a useful building for somebody else and not such a tight fit that it wasn't. So we found this quite useful in terms of analysing things, both in terms of overall building concepts, but also if you're applying a particular te technique and technology in a building. You know, in terms of design, often there's a little bit too much hopefulness during the client design dialogue about what the implications of a design solution have to be. Um, this is another thing that I did based on the office case studies, Energy Consumption Guide 19, which was then revised with John Field, who's in the audience, in 1997. And this is still there. It hasn't been maintained. And we could have got way beyond that. I mean, for BRE in 2001, we did some work on tailored benchmarks saying, can we replace this by a parametric benchmarking system you can stretch and bend for any office building? And in fact, they were keen to use that for all buildings. So you have something you really do about that. But it got handed over to Carbon Trust, who unfortunately was not interested in benchmarking at the time. So because of this outsourcing from government, because of things not meeting in the middle, because one had separate agencies, we suddenly found that the public domain infrastructure necessary for improving building performance, just building energy performance to start with, wasn't necessarily there. 
There's another bit of work we did in the 90s with Paul Roosevelt, who's in the audience, and John Field, and a number of others, Adrian Lehman, of course, on the occupant surveys. 1995, we started this series, and nearly 20 years ago now, on how buildings, where we looked at 20 buildings over seven years, and we tried to combine technical assessment, occupant assessment, and energy and environmental performance assessment. And we wrote it up in one of Richard Lorch's journals in 2001, where we sort of distilled down the results. And what we found is, you know, these buildings, which have been written up in Building Services Journal two or three years before we went to look at them, were good, but things kept on coming up. The work was divided up into packages, and the interfaces weren't terribly good. You know, the contractual interfaces, the technical interfaces, the human interfaces. Control systems were a complete mess often. You could not control the building well in the way that the designers had possibly intended that it might be. Hand over, cut the tape and run away. Not enough preparation for occupancy, not enough follow through afterwards, generally no feedback from how the product performed to the supply chains that had produced it. So, not surprisingly, one had high energy use, user dissatisfaction, and one of the big problems was unmanageable complication. What we found was that if anything tripped a building up, it was because it was too complicated or certainly too complicated from its management. So there are a number of key simple lessons, you know, make the design intent clear, make sure things you hope to take for granted, like the controls are usable. I mean, we heard at the masterclass this afternoon from one of the students, which we've seen all the time, but she was analysing, you know, domestic heating control. So you've got a boiler, a thermostat, and a programmer. And even within those three devices, most people don't understand well enough how to use them. And yet these devices are making more and more complicated by legislation. The program has lots of channels, the thermostats have lots of zones, etc. We're just losing people. Unintended, whoops, oh dear, sorry. Unintended consequences? Well, I had an unintended consequences there, blacking out the screen. So often, things work in the way you intend, but they can also work in another way. And if you don't get the feedback to spot that, you're assuming it's working well. It might not be. Just because you don't get in the complaint doesn't mean it isn't working as you intend it. So I'll think about managing expectations to avoid these credibility gaps, or performance gaps. This is something Adrian did, this was Webley School, and this was an early biomass boiler installation, and so a bit of problems with maintenance when you light up the boiler, a bit of problems with air pollution. But one of the issues here was this primary school, which had the biomass boiler, was integrated with the next door secondary school that had an oil boiler, and the integration, the complexity of integrating the two schools led to a whole new, another layer of, of problems. But of course biomass boilers are great, aren't they? So essentially out of the probe we came to this view, again, with a little sort of two-by-two two matrix, the buildings could be more or less complicated and they could lead more or less management. And essentially that gave you four types of buildings. So type A is what tends to be called a high-performance building. So a high-performance building has all the bells and whistles and it assumes you can look after them. But what we find is down here, you could have the simple building, usually these were small ones, which were well integrated, carefully sought through, but lean and mean. And called sense and science or so, so more care and thought could get a simple thing to work really well. Then up here where a building on the top right had actually more support than it expected was often where you found you know, designers in their own houses and demonstration projects and that sort of thing, which might get marvellous performance but needed more tender loving care than most people were able to give them. So the danger was you ended up in here with a building that didn't get enough TLC for what it was, which is very much what turned up as six buildings in the 1980s. And the danger is that if you're not careful, the high performance degrades to there if you can't afford to look after it. The, these ones which are overmanaged degrade to there, again, because maybe the occupier changes or something. And so what we're saying is a big danger for public buildings to get into this cell. What we really need, public buildings, is to go into here. But unfortunately, a lot of the public buildings we've procured over the last 10 years have gone into there and are now falling down the slippery slope. So, pity, so grumpy old man, but 
These are the strategic lessons which keep coming out. We set up this charity of the Useful Buildings Trust now in 2002 because government have been tuning out. What we want to do is wave a little flag for building performance. I'm afraid we've been a sort of rather sort of still small voice, but nevertheless we sort of tried to get on doing things. We've done a few things over the past decade. I think we've raised awareness of performance in use and trying to make evaluation and feedback routine. We got a big surprise working with large clients about eight or ten years ago. So we find big repeat clients weren't interested in building performance. They were interested in delivering the project and moving on to the rest of the next project. Those, the people who really care about building performance are usually the one-off clients who often get horribly let down by the industry. We drew attention to the gaps and we tried to bring people together and provide some information on the website through um, various things with postgraduate students, etc. Then we tried to do things on visibility performance and particularly through display energy certificates which I mentioned and a landlord's energy statement which allowed you to do display energy certificates in rented buildings. But then unfortunately the government didn't mandate display energy certificates in commercial buildings. So suddenly the business case for having a landlord's energy statement collapsed because there wasn't a market driver for having it. And we also to be encouraging design and building teams to focus on outcomes through partly attitudes in terms of what we call the new professionalism and the soft landing process which you can clamp on the side of any procurement system and helps to bring out the champions who can focus on building performance in use. But we weren't very successful. We've talked about all this complication that's occurred. The trouble is, all this complication, you've got less money to spend on the basics. So suddenly you've got this over-featured thing with all the go-faster stripes, but the chassis and wheels are a bit dodgy. And unfortunately, the complication in the last 10 years has spread to housing. So now things which were in the bottom right, you know, fairly simple and easy to manage, are getting laden with all sorts of technology that doesn't quite work. And nothing joins, but, but there is a business case in complication. You get captive customers. So what happens is, you know, you get the lobbyists in government who are forcing people into these, these traps where you have to spend a lot of money on supporting what you've got because you can no longer do it yourself. And so what we're finding is, we had these results from Probe, you know, 10, 12 years ago, that they're coming through in another echo. The Carbon Trust had a low carbon buildings program. Back we go again. Not basics right, too complicated. But now the renewables are coming in. Controls don't work. TSB building performance evaluation going on. Same sort of stuff. You know, why haven't we tuned into the signals properly earlier? And this is partnership for schools information on some recently completed schools. There's their benchmark. Here are most of the schools, only one of them falls below the benchmark. That, interestingly, doesn't have renewable energy supplies, whereas some of them, this is one with a biomass boiler, which does have renewable energy supplies, is using renewable energy to squander it. And this, again, happens all the time. You know, it's Merton rule I hate. You know, until you've got the efficiency and conservation side dealt with, you know, don't start plastering renewables on things because there are too many things to do. So... Where do we need to be? You know, if you want to improve building performance, well, you want to focus on performance in use, or you want to do lots of other things, like we're doing at the moment. You know, so many of this stuff is displacement activity. It is not focusing on the prime thing. We're doing things the long way around with actual performance, the hole in the middle. So what we've got is here's a sort of diagram upside down, which my colleague Isabel Carmona drew a few years ago, is also in the audience. We were saying, you know, what it's really about is it's not about the construction, it's existing buildings in normal use that you want to learn about, and then you feel a project coming on, which may be a refurbishment or a new building or whatever, and then you have a process of preparing, designing, implementing, and finishing. And we actually designed, divided both these into two. So the finish stage is not hand over the keys and walk away. The completion handover is in the middle of that. You've got operational readiness before that and then follow through and fine tuning and feedback after that. And often there's been a thing called post occupancy evaluation which looking at stuff after it's completed but often it's building performance evaluation. You can actually tune in to performance at any time in a project. You can calibrate things before you do it. You can have reality checks while you're doing it. You find out what happens after you're doing it. So let's stop micromanaging. Let's try and make real performance the objective function and get going.
everybody to own the problem, effective methods of communicating, get everybody to feed in. And then we might get there, collective understanding that this is the focus. We can all work together to improve it. But what is the public domain platform that allows all the players to start dancing together? So, the final section, how might we get there? Donella Meadows, who was one of the authors for The Limits of Growth, was really frustrated in a World Trade Association meeting in about 1997. He said, why are we always talking about parameters, standards and targets? Hang on a moment, you know, what are these all for? So she produced this sort of thing saying, hang on, you know, what are we doing? What sort of goals do we have? You know, who's setting them? Are we actually getting close to meeting them? If not, what skills do we need? What rules do we need? What information flows do we need? What are the virtuous feedback processes that can motor this thing upwards? What are the negative ones that take it down in the snake? What is happening in the system? You know, are there enormous buffer capacity like the existing building stock or whatever? What do we do about that? And then you end up down there. But again and again we find that you know, people are looking at the minutiae but not looking at the big system. So what we've got is, you know, Societies can structure expertise. So partly then you build it into commodities. So you go and buy a bag of sugar and you can take it for granted. Partly then you build it into organisations. You know, you can buy a product from X and you know or you hope that it's actually a sound product and branding is worth all right. And then there are professionals who tend to fill the gap where you're not quite commoditized or organised. And what's happened, this is somebody called Abbott who wrote a book on the system of professions 25, which was published 25 years ago, is that he thought professionalism was holding its own 25 years ago, but he thought it might move out to, instead of commodity, it might move out to organisation. Now, what we found in the UK, in particular in buildings, it has. So, essentially, we seem to be much more here. We're not relying on the visionaries. What we're trying to do is organise our way out of a very complicated problem. Or maybe we can do it by regulations, targets and tick boxes, the stiff stuff down at level 10 of Donella Meadows' hierarchy. But, you know, do we understand what we're doing? Are we sufficiently tuned in? Now, there's some work done in Cambridge that is essentially saying building energy efficiency is a wicked problem. And a wicked problem is, you know, one that you can't really pin down. You can't quite understand what the answer is until you've understood the question and started doing it. So it's unique, it's not understood until you've formulated the solutions and you probably find they're wrong. You know, you can't do lots of alternative solutions. And there's no time to say, well, we can stop now, we know what we're doing. And you haven't necessarily got an alternative to it. And now I was at a meeting in Paris at IEA a couple of weeks ago and there was a civil servant, not from the UK, who said, I'm implementing a process in energy and buildings. It's just like anything else. You know, I just implement the process. I mean, you've just got this blindness about the systemic nature of this. It's not just a technical problem. Now, Cambridge produced this diagram. So, we've got all these barriers to energy efficiency in buildings. They could be technological, they could be organisational, they could be informational, they could be socio-cultural, they could be political, they could be economic. So, all these silos which sort of come together and that's just for energy. I mean, building performance, the landscape is fairly similar, I suppose. We've got users and things coming in there too. But is there anything we could do to sort of pull things together in the middle quickly? So, the final three slides. Oh no, sorry, I've got a couple more. Sorry, Taj. Um, climate change. This paper said, this is a super wicked problem because not only are the things going on as on the previous couple of slides, but time's running out. Those who seek a solution also cause the problem and we all cause the climate change problem by being people who use energy in one way or other. We haven't got terribly good central authority and the, the future's being discounted irrationally. So we've got this tragedy. And what they said is three things we need to do. We want a sticky intervention which on a progressive incremental trajectory can both extend, trench support and expand the population it covers. Or in other words, virtuous circles of progressive improvement. So, I've got a start of a 10 on three things I think we could do that are sticky interventions. So what you can do is you can put something down 
and it helps things to snowball. And so the first thing is, it's all really about cultural ex um, adaptations. It's about getting the system to change so that people and processes and things can come together better. Visibility of in-use performance, so that can be the objective function. But that needs a well-informed technical infrastructure so that that's presented and understood in a way which people feel is relevant and appropriate. Professional ethics and practice is, can we change individuals' view of what the task they're doing so they don't just cut the tape and run away? And consolidating the knowledge domain of building performance as an independent knowledge domain with the authority to inform practice and policy making but not locked up entirely within the construction industry. So we've got display energy certificates already. This is a display energy certificate that works for the performance being driven down year on year. This is where the manager and the owner were really interested. But unfortunately this is a very underused tool at the moment. Why? Because they've been poorly supported not extended private sector buildings as I mentioned, zero investment in benchmarking since the Energy Efficiency Best Practice Program ended in 2002. And officials are treating it like the official I mentioned at IEA a couple of weeks ago. This is a bureaucratic procedure, not essentially a flywheel that could build up to help people focus on improving building performance. So, how do we get the technical infrastructure to do it? Because this is something government ought to be doing. We'll hear from Steve Selkowitz in a moment. This is something government is doing a bit in the States, but we're not doing it here. How do we get the right sort of contact point if it's not with government? Second one, review professional ethics and practices to change the nature of the game. Sustainability is about end-use performance. Now, I've worked with the EDGE Committee to produce a little list on this of things that people can do. So the sort of first one are sort of basic ethical stuff of, you know, steward of the planet, doing the right thing, having trusting relationships. The second block is very much about learning from experience, learning from the stuff that you did, not walking away. And, whoops, and the third bit is about the broader picture. Sorry, I don't know why this hasn't quite fitted on the slide on this machine. Um, but essentially trying to bring things together, challenging the assumptions, understanding the context and constraints, not just the trying to apply standard solutions to everything. And the final one is to really strengthen the representation of building use in order to create demand-side leadership. So that the knowledge domain of building use is a socially recognized area which can support and challenge the worlds of construction and property, but manages to get people better focused on the objective function. So this is something that needs to be in the public interest. And if it can start with a blank slate, you find you can push away a lot of the things which are actually hobbling our existing institutions, which, for example, tend to be single disciplinary, single disciplinary rather than interdisciplinary. So, Taj said this. He said, this sounds a bit to me like the Institute of Digital Strategies. It's something which exists independently but can both support and challenge government. It's always saying things on the BBC and the rest. The government may not like it, but they can't afford not to listen to it. So, those are my three things that I hope might help things to happen which focus better on building performance and allow us to do the enormous tasks that we have to do. And I just want to finish with this quote. Time in the life of every problem, it's big enough to see but small enough to solve. Now my worry is that it was big enough to see one or two decades ago and it may, may, may now be too big to solve. But my hope is, with all the brain power in this room and the various connections, that we can solve it if we focus on the proper objective function, which is how things are really working, not how they're supposed to work. Thank you very much.
Okay, so um, Steve Selkovitz wanted to be here from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, to respond from a, a different country to see whether this was a particular problem in the UK or not. <coughs> Unfortunately, he couldn't be with us. Um, he's actually in Helsinki now. Um, but he did compile these slides, and I just want to quickly run through a few of the slides with some of his commentary to it um, before we uh, launch into questions. Greetings, this is Steve Sarkowitz from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, or at least my virtual presence. Um, sorry I can't be with you, but I'm going to offer a few thoughts and comments on Bill's wonderful presentation, which I've at least seen in its own virtual mode. So let me start by commenting that the buildings in the U.S. have the same challenges that you do in the U.K. This shows measured versus design data. And you see that, by and large, there's a huge amount of scatter. More disappointingly, the buildings that are designed to have the lowest energy use, in fact, exceed their expected performance by factors of two or three. But the news isn't all bad. We've managed over the last 30 or 40 years to figure out how to solve some of these problems. And one of the underlying lessons is that one needs to end up with a balanced program that addresses policy issues, economic issues, technology issues, how people use buildings as a package. When you do this, you can make progress. If you don't, you won't get very far. California, for example, has managed to keep its electricity use per capita flat for 40 years by properly combining these kinds of activities. So let me pick a few of the themes that Bill has talked about. By and large, we agree with most of the issues that he's raised and the pathways for many of the solutions. We have a few twists, perhaps, that are different, but let me give you a few examples. So one of the challenges is how to present a new vision to the business world. And we've chosen here to pick this theme of guaranteed energy performance. This uh, frightens some people, it excites some people, but it basically gets them thinking about the issues of predicting performance, constructing buildings at work, and then operating them as intended. Finally, we're trying to do this at scale. We're not interested simply in showing one-offs here that work. We want to be able to produce these results throughout the building stock. So one step we can take is to do a better job of collecting and managing information across the building life cycle. Building operators who don't understand the design intent aren't going to do a very good job in operating the facility. Uh, packaging this information through some building information model or some other means is going to be essential to doing a better job of managing our buildings over time. A second major theme is the shift from solving building component by component to looking more at integrated building systems. If you want small savings, you can do that by tweaking each individual component. If we want larger savings, 50% or more, and we want to provide them more cost-effectively, it means you take advantage of integration issues. Let me close with two examples of initiatives going on in the U.S. that might help us. The first is collecting a lot of data from a lot of buildings, doing it in a careful, organized way and then building tools that allow you to parse those data sets and convert them into actionable information. These data sets have become the basis for a whole new variety of tools that can be used throughout the design process, including into construction and operations. So let me close by returning to the theme of Bill's presentation, which is we need to pay attention to real results from real buildings. We can do this in completely occupied buildings, but there are a variety of challenges in doing that. We've learned over the last few years we can do quite effective work in test beds where we've captured uh, 90 or 95 percent of the essence of the complexities of the building, including operations and people, uh, but doing it in a much more controlled way. And this is a schema that shows the new test beds we're developing at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and the intent to make them usable not just to the researchers and manufacturers developing technologies, but to building owners, to architects and engineers, and to a whole range of other stakeholders in the, in the profession. So in closing, what next? We certainly need to frame the problem properly, and thinking big is part of that. This is a wicked problem, as Bill has described. We need to pick pieces that we can
can address and solve quickly and efficiently and move forward. So the start small and act now is intended to target what we do, make some progress and move on from there. Sorry I can't be with you. Hope you've enjoyed this short discussion. Good luck. Right. Right. Well, um...